old, he has some dust on his clothes. This man is absolutely pristine. لا ولا يعرفه منا أحد and none of us knew who he was حتى جلس إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فأسند ركبتيه إلى ركبتيه until he sat in front of the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم and sat in front of him until his knees touched the knees of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم so here the ulama the muhaddithin the scholars of hadith are telling us that this person who is Jibreel alayhi salam, he's teaching us adab with Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. How do we sit before a teacher? And adab with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is extremely important. And if we breach adab with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it is as if we have breached adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, man ata'ani faqad ata'a Allah, wa man a'asani faqad a'asa Allah, kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. He said, whoever obeys me, obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever disobeys me, disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Kitab al-Shifa, Qadi Iyad mentions an interesting story that he was, uh, that Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, one of the Abbasid caliphs, was in Masjid al-Nabawi. And he was speaking to Imam Malik ibn Anas. Of course, we know Imam Malik ibn Anas, the eponym of one of the great schools of fiqh, one of the great schools of jurisprudence. Uh, and Al-Mansur, he was beginning to raise his voice. He was becoming angry with Imam Malik. And Imam Malik, he did not debate. He did not engage in uh, jidal. He thought it was haram to engage in, in polemical discourse or debate. So he did not respond, but the caliph's voice kept increasing and increasing, and they're standing in the masjid of the Prophet So Imam Malik, he says to the caliph, he says, lower your voice. And Al-Mansur is taken aback, this is the caliph. And he said to him, Imam Malik said to him, haven't you heard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, inna al-ladheena yaghudduna aswatakum inda rasulillahi ulaika al-ladheena imtahan Allahu qulubahum littaqwa lahum maghfiratun wa ajrun azim. Haven't you heard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, those who lower their voice in the presence of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those are the ones whose hearts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested for taqwa, for them is, uh, uh, for them is forgiveness and a great reward. When people would come to Imam Malik ibn Anas in Medina, when students would come to study with him, he would ask them, what do you want to study? If they said fiqh, he would say, Bismillah, let's begin studying fiqh. If they said hadith, he would go and take a shower. And he would wear white clothes. And he would tie his turban. And he would put some musk on himself. And he would burn some oud. Why? Because he's going to engage with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi this is the type of adab that they had. Ibn al-Mubarak, he relates an interesting story that one time Imam Malik was teaching al-Muwatta, his book of hadith. And in the middle of a long narration from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Imam Malik, he began to become uh, seized with some sort of pain, sort of wincing in pain in the middle of the hadith. And this would happen over and over again, 16 times. He would wince in pain in the middle of a hadith. And then after the hadith, he said, hurry, hurry, come, come. And they came, he said, look between the back and my thobe. And they looked, they had seen a scorpion had lashed him 16 times. But he's not going to break the hadith. He's not going to interrupt the words of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Imam Malik was flogged by authorities. And the man who was flogging him was actually a descendant of the Prophet So one of his teachers after he said, what were you thinking when you were being flogged? He said, at the, at the crack of every whip, I would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive this man. Allah forgive him. Allah forgive him. Why? Because he's from the family of the Prophet Muhammad This is the type of adab that we're talking about. Imam Malik relates a, uh, a story of uh, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, one of the great tabi'i. That Sa'id was leaning on the wall one time, and a man came to him and said, Ya Sa'id, I have a question for you. He said, yeah, go ahead. It's about hadith. And Sa'id, he immediately straightened himself up, fixed himself, fixed his clothes, and the man said, relax, relax. It's just a simple question about hadith. And Sa'id said, astaghfirullah. You want me to talk about the Prophet wasallam? You want me to quote his words while I'm reclining like this? This is an important issue. We're, we're speaking the words of the Prophet wasallam. So the hadith continues. So this man, he sat in front of the Prophet wasallam. 
His knees were touching his knees and he put his hands on his thighs. فَقَالَ يَا Muhammad. Now this is interesting because the Sahaba cannot address the Prophet ﷺ like this. They don't say, Ya Muhammad. They use the title of the Prophet ﷺ. Say, Ya Rasulallah. Labbaik Ya Rasulallah. May my parents be ransomed for you, O Messenger of God. This is how they would address our Master Muhammad ﷺ. So why is this person addressing him like this? The, according to the ulama, they say that Jibreel salam is posing as a Bedouin. He's posing as a Bedouin to conceal his identity. Or the ulama say that this prohibition does not apply to the malaika. Wallahu alam. And then he says, Akhbirni al Islam. Tell me about Islam. Al Islam. And the ulama say here that Islam here is the exoteric or the exterior, the lateral aspect of the religion. So the Prophet he says, Faqala Rasulullah al Islam and Tashhada Allah ilaha illallah. Islam is that you witness. There is no ilah. What is an ilah? A deity, an entity that has the intrinsic ability, intrinsic ability, independent ability to help and or harm you. There's nothing like that whatsoever except Allah. There is no ilah except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is neither strength nor power whatsoever except by the means of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a messenger of God. وَتُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ And that you establish the prayer. وَتُؤْتِيَ الزَّكَاةِ That you give the uh, zakah, the poor do. وَتَصُومَ رَمَضَانِ And that you fast Ramadan. وَتُحُجَّ الْبَيْتِ إِنِ اسْتَطَعْتَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا And that you make hajj if you can afford to do so. قَالَ صَدَقْتَ so this man, Jibril alayhi salam, he says, that's true. And Sayyidina Umar says, فَعَجِبْنَا لَهُ يَسْأَلُهُ وَيُصَدِّقُهُ Sayyidina Umar says, that surprised us. He's asking the question and then he confirms his answer. Who does this man think he is? Of course he's sadaqta. Of course he's sadaqa. This is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. Sayyidina Umar doesn't know who this man is at this point. فَقَالَ أَخْبِرْنِي عَلَى الْإِيمَانِ Now tell me about iman. In the ulama say, the vertical dimension here, the esoteric dimension. The Prophet sallallahu he said in a hadith Bukhari and Muslim, al-Muslimu man salim al-Muslimuna min lisanihi bi yadihi. Wa yadihi. Aw kama qala alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, the Muslim is the one uh, from whose tongue and hands, his speech and his violence, other, re -Muslim, other Muslims remain safe. That's the Muslim, the true Muslim. But then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in a hadith in Tirmidhi, Al Mu'minu, Man Aminahu Nasu ala Dima'ihim wa Amwalihim, O Kamakala alayhi salatu wasalam. But the Mu'min, the person of Iman, the Mu'min is the one whom humanity, humanity, and Nas, all of humanity trusts with their blood, meaning their lives and their wealth. He's not going to violate their lives and their wealth. That's the Mu'min. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he responds by saying, قَالَ أَن تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ أَن تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ What is al-iman? That you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is above tashhada and tashhada. أَن لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ It's more than just witnessing. There are some people who accept the rational proposition that Allah is one. There is one God. But their iman is incomplete because they don't have qabool and id'an. They don't have acceptance and submissiveness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is extremely important. Just accepting the rational proposition that God is one is not enough. That's what shaitan does. You don't think shaitan knows that Allah is one? You don't think shaitan knows the Prophet sallallahu is Rasulullah? Of course he does. But why is he a kafir? He's not mu'min, Muslim, no. Why is he a kafir? The Quran says he's kafir. Why? Because he doesn't have qabool and id'an. He doesn't accept, he doesn't accept that. And he doesn't have submissiveness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is al-iman. And then he continues to believe in Allah wa malaikatihi. And you believe in his angels. And there are millions of angels according to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu But we know the names of the major angels and we believe in them. Jibril alayhi salam, Gabriel, Mikail or Mikal alayhi salam, Michael, Israfil who blows the trump, Seraphiel, Israel, right? Azriel, the angel of death, Malakul Maut, Kiram and Katibin, the recording angels, Malik, the angel who is in charge, the keeper of the hellfire, Ridwan, the angel who is the keeper of, of Jannah, 
and other angels, Munkar and Nakir, the angels who will conduct the inquisition in our graves according to the sound hadith, wherever your ajab is. You say, well, if I'm not in my grave, what if they incinerate my body? At the end of your coccyx, at the end of your tailbone, there's something called al-ajab. That's the seed of the human being. That's the first thing that grows in the fetus. The body, the flesh grows around it. Wherever that ajab is on earth, that's where the inquisition will happen. And the angels will ask us three questions. Three questions. There's no ikhtilaf about these questions. The angels are not going to ask you, what is your madhab? The angels are not going to ask you, what is your country of origin? What is your race? They're not going to ask you these questions. What are they going to ask you? The questions that are very important, the most important. There's no ikhtilaf about the answers. Man rabbuk, man rabbuk, who is your Lord? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa man nabiyuk, who is your Prophet? Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ba dinuka, what is your religion? Al-Islam. These are the questions. We believe in the angels. Wa kutubihi, we believe in his books. We believe in the Torah and the Zabur and the Injil and the Quran and many other books that were revealed to the prophets. Most of them we don't know their names. Rusulihi, and we believe in the messengers. And according to the hadith, and there's a weakness in the, in the hadith, so we don't insist upon it. There's 124,000 al anbiya and 313 of them are rusul. They receive a sharia and they implement the sharia according to the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu alam. Wal yawm al akhir. And we believe in the last day. Why is it called the last day? Because there's no night that proceeds from this day, the day of judgment. So then he says, وَتُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدْرِ And that you believe in the qadr. And notice how the Prophet ﷺ answered this. He said, And تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ And then he repeats the verb, وَتُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدْرِ why does he repeat what tu'mina bil qadri? That you believe in divine decree. Why does he repeat the verb according to the ulama? Because this is something difficult for people to, to conceive of. The qadr, the divine apportionment, the divine ordainment, uh, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, however you want to translate it, min azaliyya, that was determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in pre eternality. And then we have qada, the playing out of that qadr in space time. This is difficult for people to wrap their heads around. And people who dive, ta'amuk, they dive, uh, as Imam al tahawi says in his creed, into the qadr. This is impermissible. Ultimately, we won't understand. It's like explaining calculus to a toddler. They'll get some numbers, one, two, three, four, and then it's an exercise in futility. They're not going to understand it. We're incapable of understanding it. And their ulama warned, those who dive into the qadr and want to dive and understand the secrets of the qadr, they're going to become an extremist. They're going to adopt one position, which is hulua, either of the jabariya, the determinists, who say that everything is determined and um, I have no volition whatsoever, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can never put me into jahannam. Or they get the other extreme, another hulua, where they say they become of the qadariya. I have absolute volition. I can do whatever I want. And Allah doesn't even know what I'm going to do. Both of these positions are extreme positions. We accept the qadr. We accept it as a supra-rational aspect of our religion. Our, our aql has to make sajda to it. Our aql has to make sajda to it. It's beyond our comprehension. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, he repeats, what tu'mina bil qadri, khayrihi wa sharrihi. It's good and it's evil. Qala sadaqta, that's true. Qala fa'akhbirni al ihsan. Tell me about al ihsan. So we have the horizontal horizon, we have the, the vertical uh, aspect, and now we have the transcendental or relational aspect of the religion. What is al ihsan? And ta'bud Allah ka anna ka tarah. The Prophet ﷺ said, It is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as though you can see Him, as though you are raptured in the beatific vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ru'ya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ru'ya haqqun, the ahli jannah, the vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a reality for the people of paradise, according to Abu Ja'far al Tahawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, and there's many ayat and hadith that go into that, we won't go into it now. But he says to worship Allah as though you see him, and if you can't see him, then know that he sees you. One of my teachers used the analogy, like you're driving down the street and a policeman, a police officer is behind you, and you know he sees you. So that's called mushahada, witnessing. You know that the police sees you. Mushahada. And then you have muraqaba, vigilance. So what do you do when you, you drive the same crazy way? No, you don't pull out your cell phone. At least that's illegal in California, I don't know about Florida. You turn on your blinkers, you make a full stop, 
But the better analogy is like a child who's into some mischievous things and then he sees his father looking at him. Mushahada and then muraqaba and so he stops what he's doing not out of fear of the whip or getting a ticket or going to jail but because he loves his father and he doesn't want to displease his father. This is a better analogy. Qala fa'akhbirni an sa'ah Tell me about the sa'ah, the hour. Qala man mas'ulu anha bi'a'lami min as-sa'ili Right? So the Prophet sallallahu he says to him, the one being questioned knows no more than the questioner. No one knows the sa'a. Yas'alunaka anis sa'ati ayyana mursaha. Qul inna ma ilmuha inda rabbi. They ask thee concerning a sa'a, the hour, when will it be? Say the knowledge of it is only with my Lord, is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fa'akhbirni an amaratiha. Well tell me about its signs. And this is interesting because usually when we hear the hadith Jibreel, we hear about Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, and usually that's where the hadith ends. But the hadith continues. It continues. Tell me about the sa'a. Tell me about the signs of the sa'a. And talid al amatu rabbataha. That a slave girl will give birth to her master. A slave girl will give birth to her master. And the ulama say this is an indication of filial calcitrance or disrespect of parents disrespect of parents and then you will see the barefoot naked destitute shepherds competing in the construction of tall buildings there are some Muslim majority countries today we're not going to name drop but 50 years ago or so, they were Bedouins living in tents. And now they have high-rise buildings that put the Sears Tower to shame. It's dwarfed, according to these buildings. Competing in the construction of high buildings. Hassan al-Basri, one of the great tabi'i, he said he walked into the living quarters of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, where the Prophet ﷺ actually lived. He was a 10-year-old boy at the time, Hassan al-Basri. He said he could reach up and touch the ceiling with his hands. This is where the Prophet ﷺ lived. Khayr al khalq the best of creation. And then, so this is interesting because the Prophet ﷺ, he told us of things to come towards the end of time. He even predicted things to happen during the lives of the Sahaba. Once the Prophet ﷺ was on Jabal Uhud, sound hadith, and he was with Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, and the mountain started to shake. And he said, Uthbut Uhud, fa inna ma'alaika nabiyun. Wasshahidan. Said be still, O Uhud, for verily upon you is a prophet, a truthful one, and two martyrs, meaning uh, Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Uthman. One time the Prophet said, Ali and Zubair in Medina, they were sitting and they were laughing. And the Prophet said, One day you two will oppose each other on the battlefield and you will be in the wrong. And he pointed to as Zubair ibn Awam. Many years later at the Battle of Jamal, after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, Zubair is walking, his sword is unsheathed. Sayyidina Ali sees him from a distance. He says, remember that day we were sitting and laughing in Medina? And the Prophet ﷺ said that one day we're going to be on the opposing sides of the battlefield and you will be in the wrong. Today is that day. Sayyidina Zubair's face turned pale. He sheathed his sword and walked off the battlefield. The Prophet ﷺ said to Sayyidina Ali, this is found in the tarikh. Uh, tarikh al-Khulafa, Imam Suyuti mentions this in his book. That the Prophet ﷺ, he came to Sayyidina Ali and he said, there's two people that are, going to have, that are going to have a terrible punishment in the nar, in the hellfire. The fair-skinned man who hamstrung the naqatullah, the she-camel of Salih ﷺ, the Bani Thamud. And the man who's going to strike you here. And this, and he grabbed his beard ﷺ, is going to be saturated with blood. And Imam Ghazali says in Kitab Dhikr al Maut, Wa Ma Ba'ata, Book 40 of the Ihya, that when Sayyidina Ali was walking out of the masjid in Kufa after Fajr, a man jumped in front of him from the Khawarij and struck him on top of the head, and immediately blood rushed down the face of, the, of, of uh, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and, and saturated his, blood, his, his beard with blood. And Sayyidina Ali fell back and he said, Fuztu wa Rabbil Ka'aba. Fuztu wa Rabbil Ka'aba. I have triumphed by the Lord of the Ka'aba. I have won by the Lord of the Ka'aba. Sadaqa Rasulullah. Sadaqa Rasulullah. The Messenger of God has spoken the truth. The Prophet ﷺ predicted the martyrdom of Imam, of Imam Hussein in the Hadith of Tabarani. He was in the sleeping quarters of Umm Salama. And Umm Salama said that he would wake up 
and he was disturbed and he'd fall back asleep and then he'd wake up agitated, disturbed and he'd fall back asleep and then wake up again very disturbed and she said I saw in his hand he had some red soil and he was kissing it he said, Ya Rasulullah, what is this? And he said that Jibreel alayhi salam has informed me that this son of mine is going to be martyred in the desert. Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And I asked Jibreel alayhi salam to bring me some of the soil of that land. This sound hadith in our books. And these are about the Sahaba at his time. He told Suraqa bin Malik who had chased the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam during the hijrah. And he fell fallen from his horse three times. And the Prophet ﷺ says to Suraqa bin Malik, do you want something better? And he said, yes, because he was coming for a hundred camels, right? hundred camels, dead or alive. That was the bounty on the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, do you want something better? He said, yes. He said, kayfa bika idha labista siwara kisra. How is it for you that you're going to wear the bangles, the bracelets of kisra? And he said, man kisra? Who is kisra? He said, Malikul Faris, the king of Persia. To the simple Bedouin man, Suraka bin Malik. Many years later, over 20 years later, when the Muslims had conquered Persia, al Qadisiyah, and the, and the treasures of Persia were in the masjid, Sayyidina Umar, he calls Suraka bin Malik up to the minbar and he puts the bangles of Kisra on the arms of Suraka bin Malik. And the entire masjid erupted. Sadaqa Rasulullah, Sadaqa Rasulullah, Sadaqa Rasulullah. When the Prophet ﷺ was living in Mecca, uh, he wanted to go inside the Kaaba. And the holder of the key was a man named Uthman ibn Talha. And this was a time, obviously, when there was great persecution of the Sahaba. And this, the, the Kaaba was surrounded by these asnam, these idols. So the Prophet ﷺ said to Uthman, give me the key so I can go inside the Kaaba. And Uthman said, no way. So give me the key, no way. Perhaps you'll see that key one day in my hand. And he said, over Quraysh's dead body. Many years later, at Fatha Mecca, the Prophet Sallallahu comes into Mecca and he has the key in his hand and he opens the door of the Kaaba, destroys the idols and he puts it into the hand of Uthman ibn Talha who became Muslim, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The Prophet Sallallahu also has hadith that are called eschatological hadith. Hadith of the end of time, the akhir zaman And there's many of these and they're quite interesting. We don't have time to go into much of these. Very, very interesting hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said at the end of time there's going to be al-haraj. Al-haraj. And the Sahaba said, what is al-haraj? And he said, massive bloodshed. The one killing, the qatil, doesn't know fima qatala, doesn't know why he's killing. And the maqtul, the one being killed, doesn't know fima qutila, why he's being killed. I talked to a man who was in the American military. This is a true story. He came up to me after a lecture one time. Non-Muslim, he was Catholic, very young man. He approached me with tears in his eyes. He said, I have to tell you something. I said, what do you want to tell me? He said, I've killed many of your brothers. Will God forgive me? I said, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that if tawbah is made and there's requisites of it, he'll forgive every sin. He said, yeah, but I killed children. I killed children. I said, why did you do that? He said, I was ordered to. I said, so what? Why did you do it? I don't know. I don't know. The qatil doesn't know why he's killing. Well, the man in Afghanistan who was teaching in a masjid, and he left the masjid for a minute and there was a bomb that was dropped in the masjid. You see these things on satellite television. This is not going to make the corporate media. And all the children perished. And they asked this man. They interviewed him. Why did they bomb this masjid? He said, I have no idea. They're looking for so-and-so. They, they, they name dropped. You know this person? I've never heard of him. Really? The one being killed doesn't know why he's killing. The one killed doesn't know why he's being killed. He said, sudden death will become common. Sudden death, like bombs and bullets. Did you know in the 23 years of the Prophet ﷺ, he fought many Ghazawat, military expeditions. According to Abu Hassan al-Nadawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, how many casualties were there in all of the military expeditions? He puts number 1,018. And these are men on the battlefield. 700 enemy, 300 Muslims, 1,018. In one shot, 100,000 people perish at Hiroshima. On impact, 100,000 people, subhanAllah, 100 million people died in the 20th century. 100 million people in the 20th century. We're supposed to be getting more humane with our technology, right? I thought the pre-modern man was violent. What's going on? How are we using technology? 100 million, 55 million World War II alone. Al-Harj, massive bloodshed. Sadaqa Rasulullah. 
He said the nations will invite each other. And he used the word umam. The umam will invite each other to the slaughtering of Muslims. Like they're inviting each other to a banquet. This hadith, sound hadith. One of the companions, because these are Arabs, right? They don't take these things lightly. Say, what? We're going to be slaughtered? We must be very small in number, right? Bal antum yoma idhin. Kathirun, kathirun, kathirun. You are many, many, many on that day. But you're like the, the scum on the ocean. Ghutha'un. Ghutha is sail, the froth on the ocean. There's, no, there's nothing to you. You're one dimensional. You're superficial people. The Ummam, we know the United Nations. When we talk about United Nations, we're talking about US, Israel, France, Britain. What happened in 1924? After the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire and the beginning of colonialism, what have these countries done to the Muslim majority world? I'll let you do the research because I'm almost out of time. He said, rain will be burning, acidic. Fornication will be open. Fornication is open, right? Everyone's pornified, right? It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Now it's becoming mainstream with this haram, 50 shades of haram, whatever it's called. Women will walk around naked yet clothed. When he saw Kasiyat and Ariyat, women walk around naked yet they're clothed. And you see, you'll see many types of alcohol. Many different types of alcohol. Divorce will be rampant. Now Muslim community is 60%. Divorce is halal. Sometimes people just can't live with each other. It's the most odious halal. But I know people, I do counseling. I know people in their 20s, Muslim couples in their 20s, been divorced 20, uh, two, three, four times. In their 20s already. What's happening? He said, there are going to be dual income families, the Prophet ﷺ said. He said, a woman will help her husband earn, not out of necessity. If you have to do it, then you have to do it. But that's not what he said. He said, a mother will abandon her children, hirsan ala dunya, just out of covetousness for dunya. They just want dunya so bad, they'll abandon their children. Put the children with a nanny who doesn't really care. Put the children, the child in front of the video games so they can play God of War and Grand Theft Auto. And they go shoot up to school. You wonder what's going on with these children in suburbia. Why? They had a good upbringing. <clears throat> men will dress like women. Women will dress like men. People will wear musical instruments on their head and dance around like pigs and monkeys. I go on the subway. It's called the BART in the Bay Area. And you see them plugged in and just say, hello, hello, just dancing around, plugged in. You know, that's, that's the reality of some people. We're out of time. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله المصطفى وعلى ساداتنا وإمتنا أبي بكر عمر عثمان وعلي ورضي الله تعالى عن أصحاب رسول الله إجمعين. يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه العزيز إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حمد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حمد مجيد اللهم إنا نسألك بنور وجهك الكريم وبحقك عليك حسن الخاتم عند الممات لنا ولأحبابنا ولجميع المسلمين يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا في ما أعطيت وقنا الشر ما قضيت ربنا لا تزي قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة في الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا نكوننا أن من الخاسرين يا مقلب القلوب الأبصار ثبت قلوبنا على دينك يا مقلب القلوب الأبصار ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك وصلى الله على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون وقيموا الصلاة